Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host, a meteorologist DT from weatherist.com, the colonel of confusion, the captain of catastrophe, the commander of chaos. It's a midnight here on the Saturday night on the East Coast, uh, and I guess 9 p.m. on the West Coast, going into early Sunday morning, and it's time to talk about This Week in Weather. Lots to talk about this particular edition here. Uh, we'll talk about the Bering Sea Superbomb, uh, the weak El Nino event, which is here, the coming cold, the potential of first significant snows, especially over the Midwest. Uh, problems with some of the Climate Prediction Center teleconnection charts. You'll see that uh, they are actually quite flawed in a lot of areas and not very useful. And they give off false, false signals, and people uh, really aren't using them correctly. And then finally, we'll talk about the uh, high-resolution 13-kilometer GFS versus the regular GFS. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, the new res GFS is performing much better, much closer to the European and the GFS ensemble mean. So that's a good, encouraging sign going into the winter. Of course, this high, this the, the cold has been talked about for a long time now. Uh, I've been talking about it for a while. A lot of other different forecasters have been, so it's nothing new, but it's uh, right around the corner here this morning. Temperatures will get down to the low uh, mid-20s here, and uh, so very impressive uh, cold pattern coming up here for the middle and second half of November going into December. Now, this here is the official uh, forecast map from the Ocean Prediction Center, folks, at, over there at NWS, and you can see early Saturday morning uh, the huge storm there in the Bering Sea reached 928 millibars. The record is 924, which it broke this morning. The, more, the record, excuse me, 925 millibars. It did reach 924 a few hours after this map was made, and uh, that is the record for the lowest storm ever uh, seen in the Bering Sea. Hurricane, anything else, lowest ever. So um, very impressive. Of course, pressure that low is, in fact, as strong as a Category 5 hurricane. In terms of the pressure, it wasn't quite that massive in terms of the wind field, but still uh, 100 mile an hour winds reported at many, many locations in the Bering Sea. Now let's talk about the El Nino here. If you look at this, is the folks in the Climate Prediction Center. You can see that this is dated November 6th, and this 58%, as you can see there, is actually lowering it from what it was. And the reason they do that is because they don't think it's going to last um, for uh, a particularly long period of time. In other words, uh, it has to be five overlapping consecutive three-month variable values. Uh, greater than half a degree Celsius or warmer. So they don't think there's going to be five, and as a result, they lower the chances, and, as we, and that's led people to think that maybe the El Nino is not going to develop or not going to be a bigger factor. This is a mistake. Um, of course, if you have to use that official five overlapping consecutive three-month cycles, um, that's fine, but uh, that doesn't mean the atmosphere is not responding like an El Nino. This is the latest data. As you can see, uh, the, all the regions here are warming significantly. We've seen some pretty big uh, uh, increases here and here and here. Interestingly enough, over the last two weeks, uh, the region, uh, and so this is actually going down here, which may be indicating that the whole western regions are warming up. And as you can see, they have been. And that may be the beginning of the Motokai El Nino which I talked about in my winter forecast, and a lot of people have talked about as well. All right, let's talk about how this cold pattern is going to shape up. Now, this is, this is November 11th here. As you can see, this is the Veterans Day, uh, 11 here, 11. And here is the front like this, okay, and there's low pressure here. Here's the Arctic. Look at this impressive cold up in here, 1050 millibars. And this is a big, pretty big snowstorm here for the central and upper plains and the upper Midwest. Now, east of the Mississippi River, look how warm it is here, folks. Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, uh, uh, down to the Mississippi, Tennessee, pretty warm until this low passes. So uh, don't be surprised if the next couple of days turn out to be quite warm here, um, east of the Mississippi River. Now, eventually what happens, happens, this is now Thursday, the 13th, and the low, of course, is uh, way up here, as you can see, uh, northeast of Montreal. So it goes from Illinois this way, as you can see. And once it does, that's when the cold air sweeps southward. The high comes in here, as you can see. We have strong north winds, and the cold air comes rushing southward. So it does not arrive on the east coast until Thursday at the earliest, probably Thursday night or Friday. That's the important point of this. Now, some of the models have been developing a wave of low pressure over North Carolina, and uh, the GFS had it early Saturday morning. The high-resolution GFS had it. It's, it may be something that we'll have to watch and see. It's not a big deal, but it could bring maybe some frozen precipitation. If the wave is close enough to the North Carolina, Virginia area, Maryland area, maybe. Maybe. it's Right now, it's a not a high-probability event. And, in fact, most of the models on Saturday afternoon took the event away. So keep that in mind. Okay, now this is for Friday, the 14th of November, and you can see um, 
again, look at these uh, cold uh, highs here, and the front is down like this. And you can see, look at these tremendous winds across the Great Lakes. A lot of very impressive lake effect snow here coming up starting on Thursday and Friday, continuing for most of the weekend. That's probably going to be record November lake effect snow in some areas, I would suspect. And now what happens is if you go towards day 8, 9, and 10, uh, the first cold high moves off the coast. As you can see, it's now off here. Okay, the next one is here, and there's a weakness in here, and what happens is the low tracks up this way. Now, a lot of people are wondering how come the low is not going to go to the East Coast, and I'll explain to that in a second here. One of the reasons is you can have all the different great patterns you have, but there's always something that goes wrong. Now, if we look at this carefully, we see this there is, in fact, a 50-50 um, low here over southeastern Canada. That's where you want to see that. We have a negative NEO right here. We have a big ridge on the west coast. We want to see that. There you go. Okay. So what's the problem? There's the low. And as you can see, it's going up this way. Well, one of the reasons is because, see this trough? Look where this trough is. It's way west of the Mississippi River. That's way too far to the west for an east coast snowstorm. You have to get that trough over the Mississippi River. That's way, way to the west. It's over the Plain States. And as a result, the low develops over the Delta and tracks up through Ohio. So... Uh, even when you have everything working for you, it's always something. That's one. Of this that's why this is a good map to look at. All right, this is the European here, uh, the upper level map, uh, day nine again, and you can see uh, very impressive features here. Um, this here is your negative uh, NEO right in here, as you can see, and this here is your EPO right in here, Alaska Ridge. Okay, and there's your vortex. Look at that baby right over uh, Michigan. Very impressive, and the whole thing has a negative Arctic oscillation as well. But notice this feature. The operational European GFS is breaking off something which is coming this way and twice to crash into the coast. We'll see that in a second here. This is what it looks like with the map. This is the same map as this, just different projections, all right? Same map as that. Now, we'll look at the low there over eastern Michigan, Lake Huron here, 988, I think that is. Very impressive low, tremendous winds. Look at those isobars across um, uh, the Greece, eastern Great Lakes here. Look at this. You can really see it very nicely. And you can see, of course, the uh, front is now, uh, this is the reinforcing front. This is the second cold front moving this way here. And there's a very strong ridge and so on and so forth. So and there's your negative NAO right in here. Very impressive, uh, tremendous heavy lake effect snows coming again. And this is what looks like a day 10. This looks like January. Huge, huge Arctic air coming southward. And again, notice this tremendous, w look at these winds that's coming southward here. <laughs> Why did it cost the Great Lakes? And there's the low pressure area right in here. So, um, can't, you know, very impressive looking map here. And this is the European now, again, the operational map here at uh, day 10. And it also has that big storm coming in, like the, right here. You can see it. Okay, so our question is is this real? Because this looks like it wants to crash and undercut the ridge. So that's the issue. I don't know if it's real, but if we look at the European ensemble, we'll see, in fact, that it is. Not. There is no big storm here coming into the eastern Pacific Ocean. That's also important news for California. We do not see this. There's nothing there, as you can see. Here's our very strong ridge. This is our negative EPO. The ridge goes all the way up to Alaska. Here's our negative NAO, and there's the vortex. Very nice. All right. And this is overall looking at the overall map here at day 10, uh, the large hemispheric shot. You can see all the features here. Uh, put one vortex over central uh, Eurasia, as you can see. Right here. The other one is here. And there's our different features, as I've pointed out, very clearly seen. And there's the Aleutian uh, low right here. So very, very impressive looking map, day 10. And this is the GFS. And again, the GFS at uh, day 10, look, it's got this low here coming in. But again, if you look at all the models, again, this would threaten to move into California and break apart the ridge and knock the pattern down. So is it real? No. The GFS ensemble say it's not there. It's a pretty weak-looking system. So, um, uh, you know, we'll see if that works out or not. Uh, this was from early uh, Saturday morning. But again, you can see that uh, that system, which was coming in, according to the GFS, goes into here, here, and here. Here comes another one. But if you, if you look at the GFS ensemble, this is the GFS ensemble. It doesn't have that. So, uh, and it keeps a very strong ridge on the west coast, as you can see. The ridge has not weakened at all. Amazing. Uh, there's the upper low. Huge trough here. Very cold like that. And a lot of blocking up in here with all this different stuff. Tremendous heights up there. So, we'll see if that storm threatening California is real in the eastern Pacific. I don't think it is. And this is the GFS uh, comparison between the high resolution, 
uh, this one and the next one. And you can see, notice a co couple of features here. There's the Arctic High. As you can see, there's a huge storm in eastern Canada. That's fine. And if we take a look at this, GFS, regular one, nothing. The high is weaker. There's no big storm in eastern Canada. The pattern is breaking down. So the GFS high resolution is doing a really good job here. Much look like, look, looking a lot like the uh, uh, European and the GFS ensembles. Now, let's talk about teleconnections here. Now, this you can get from the Climate Prediction Center, and a lot of people use this stuff, but this stuff is flawed because all of this is based off the GFS, and they really the regular GFS, not the high resolution. So this, as you can see, PNSSI, but look at here. It actually has the NAO being positive into the middle of November. Wrong. It has the uh, WPO uh, positive, then negative, that's wrong, and then here positive, and then negative, and neutral again. And again, that's wrong. And you'll see why in a second. But this is part of the problem. Now, this is from yesterday, okay? The Arctic Oscillation here, this is from the folks at Weather Bell, and notice what they do here. They show that the Arctic Oscillation is dropping very strongly on the last several runs. But look at the GFS uh, from CPC. The CPC goes to here, and then brings it back up again. What is that? That's ridiculous. I don't know where it's getting it from, but it's wrong, as you can see. Now, this is the ones from today, and you can see the Arctic Oscillation on the uh, GF, uh, from the CPC. Again, this is based off the GFS. Uh, brings it down, as you can see here. Let me zoom and see if I can zoom this up a little bit. And you can see that it, it comes down here, and then it goes back up again. And that's just ridiculous. So, um, there it is, you can see. And then the next one, this is the NAO, and the NAO, according to this here, is uh, neutral. It stays neutral all the way through, and you can see that that's not correct at all. The maps clearly show they're a very strong negative NAO. And then the PNA is positive to neutral. Very weak, no strong signal from the PNA. Now, these are the folks from Weather Bell. What they do is they look at the European and Ensemble. And uh, as you can see, they run the last four or five consecutive model runs in a row here. This is a very useful product, I must say. And this is the NAO current, and you can see. Look at all the constant negative values in here. The greens. See the greens? Greens are down this way. And this is the Arctic Oscillation. Look at this. Strongly negative and then all the way through. So the, according to this, and you can see last several runs have all showed the NAO running negative. Why, the, why CPC doesn't have that, I don't know, but it doesn't. So that's one of the reasons why you can't use that, GF, that GFS CPC crap because, well, it's, it does, it's wrong. It's wrong. Um, you know, and this is the, uh, the Western Pacific Oscillation. And again, you can see it going negative, and the EPO strongly negative all the way through. You can see negative, negative. The last several runs very strongly negative. Look at this stuff. Minus seven. My God, way down here. Not according to the CPC stuff on the and the GFS. And you can see the differences here. Here's the GFS. The the this is the EPO, right? Let me see if I can enlarge this a little bit. Yeah. Notice that the uh, European is the model which has it down here. Look what the GFS does. Brings it back up in this way. See? There's the green GFS. There it is. Again, it's just, it's wrong. It's not, it's not correct. But. And here's the, the now this is the, all the models here for the PNA. They're pretty good here. But this is the NAO. Again, notice the European, the blue line there is much deeper than the GFS. Now, why is this important? Well, each one of these teleconnections tell us something. Remember, if we assume that the Arctic Oscillation is going to stay negative through most of November, what does that look like? Well, in all the Novembers, when you have an Arctic Oscillation, this is when it's positive. So you have to flip it because we're talking about a negative NEO. So these yellows are actually blues, and you have a very cold-looking pattern. Here, this is the uh, what does a, n a negative EPO look like for November? This is all the negative EPOs in the last uh, 60 or 70 years. During the month of November, what were the temperatures looking like? This. That's impressive cold. Wow. This is the PDO. All the Novembers where you had a PDO of over 1, which we have right now, 1.8. And you can see, very, very cold November. And then this is the Western Pacific Oscillation. Again, this is the positive phase, but as we know, the WPO is going to be negative. So flip the colors. The yellows become blues, and you have a cold pattern. And finally, if we look a little further out, this is the uh, CFS. This is run by Kyle McRitchie, a, a doctoral student up at the University of Albany. And uh, he had, uses the CFS a little differently here. Now, this is the CFS ensemble filtered. Okay, it's not the deterministic run. It's the uh, ensemble right here, as you can see. And what it's showing for, November, for uh, December 8, as you can see right in here, this is the valid time frame. It has a very strong block, which develops over eastern Canada, a very strong negative NEO. And I'm wondering if this is going to have an impact for some potential early winter weather. We'll see. 
This is meteorologist DT from weatherist.com. I'll talk to you soon.